Mark, these are pretty strange times at the moment with not a lot of certainty, but it's good to speak to you again to field questions from the fans. We're going to start a little bit further uh, down the line, looking ahead to next season. Uh, the first question was, looking ahead in regard to next season's kit, are we likely to get a standard Nike template again or a bespoke kit with slightly unique design? Yeah, no, one of the downsides of going with Nike was you know, the trade-off compared to Sondico, who, who were a smaller company, but we had a lot of flexibility in um, our kit designs and how we presented that and how we interacted with our fan base on that. Um, so Sondico, that was a positive of theirs. The negative of going with a Nike, a Puma or an Adidas is that we have very little say on the kit designs. They work off templates. Um, I believe they do do it for some of the larger clubs in their stable. You, you like to Barcelona and that, but that's very few and far between. And their, their business model doesn't stack up to do, um, let's just say we do 15 to 20,000 kits per year. For those quantities, they just don't add up in their business model. So unfortunately, the, 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 the answer is straight as always is, is no, it's going to be a template kit next season. If you go back, I've seen some online with the Portsmouth skyline um, embedded into the shirt, and I, I absolutely love it, but I just don't think it's something we're going to be able to get Nike to agree to. We'll try it, and we have kept trying. Next season gets chosen months and months and months ago. So next season's a no, but for the following season, it is something we are going to discuss with them because I do like just having that slight individuality. But if it doesn't fit with their business model, unfortunately, it's outside of our control. You, you must just love seeing those different designs coming in from fans and showing off their creativity. Yeah, keep them coming. As I said, the one with the Pompey skyline that I saw embedded into, you know, a blue background of a kit was absolutely fantastic. Loved it. And as I say, it is something that we are going to be discussing with Nike moving forward. But I can't promise anything because... Nike is not our business. We can control our business, but we can't control theirs. Back to the back to the here and now. There's been a lot of talk, obviously, about different scenarios in, to re in review to finishing this current season. Can you give us an overview of where we are now and which version looks favourite at the moment? Um, I think favourite changes every single day. Um, we're we're at the mercy of the government, their guidelines, what their recommendations are in regards of this virus. Um, if you look at Rick Parry, our EFL chair statement, he said we need 56 days to complete the season in an orderly fashion. So if you use the player contracts end at the end of June, those out of contract, and we've got seven, eight players out of contract, other clubs have got more or less their whole squad out of contract. So every club's different, but from Portsmouth's point of view, the, the, contracts end at the end of June across the board every single club but then you have this month severance so it gives players the month of July to go and find another club historically where you during that period you know we're discussing um, with players that we're looking to bring in and the players that are leaving are discussing with other clubs so you have that month severance pay so technically speaking to the PFA individual players with a lot of goodwill from all parties you could ask the players to play on during that month of July because they're covered by that month severance pay anyway. And as I say, that everyone seems sympathetic to that idea. So if you go to the end of July as a line in the sand of when you could, in an orderly fashion, finish the season and then roll back from there, 56 days back brings you to the first week of June. The medical experts, physios, you know, players themselves, various groups, are saying that the players will need at least two to three weeks to bring them up to match fitness. So if you roll back another two to three weeks from the first early June, you come back to mid-May. So logically, if you can't start training by mid-May, that timeline pushes back beyond the end of July, unless you make a decision not to finish the season in an orderly fashion, i.e. the 56 days are condensed, maybe there's not a home and away playoff semi-final and, and final. It may be, you know, it just might be at one neutral ground to get, you know, to, to shorten that timeline rather than playing home and away. You just play one game at a neutral ground. The two winners of the semi-finals go into the final. And instead of having a week, two weeks gap, that is condensed down to a couple of days. So there are ways you could shorten that period. I've also seen about 
using neutral venues and you play multiple games during any given period. So to, you, there are ways of shortening that 56 day period, but to finish the season in what I would call an orderly fashion, you would have to be training by the middle of May. So we're in the, coming to the end of April. Can I see training resuming in the next two to three weeks? Possibly. I, I can't. There's no inside knowledge there. The EFL don't know. The Premier League don't know. It's down to Boris Johnson, his government, and the medical advisors around him. So that, that's the reality of it. You could technically go beyond the end of July. However, speaking to a lot of other club chairmen, they're saying with no season ticket money coming in, potentially a good chance of no money coming in for the end of this season because the games in all scenarios will probably be played behind closed doors. They're not willing to extend players' contracts because they simply won't have the money. And they're saying they will play the youth team. If you're then saying you're playing your youth team players, then to me, there's no integrity then in, in the league. And then you, then you follow that logical path one step further. And if there's no integrity, that's the main reason for trying to finish the league. What, what happens then? Does it finish now with where you are in the league? Is it points per game? Or do you just void the season? Um, personally, if the season isn't completed, I would be bitterly, bitterly disappointed. Um, but I would be even, I would go from disappointment to frustrated, stroke, angry if clubs then are promoted and the season hasn't finished. I think it's, we're all in it together where the season doesn't finish, you know, or we finish the season and we abide by the, the, the league table at that point. To do anything in between, for me personally, and this isn't company policy, it's not something, you know, we've even really started discussing at the EFL at this moment, but I would personally feel aggrieved if the current top two or top three went up, um, you know, and where we still had nine games to go because to me, the season hasn't finished. It's not a complete season. And trying to finish this season about is all about integrity. If you go down that route, then our integrity is gone. Like, that's my opinion. The Atkinson Stanley owner thinks the season should finish now. Peter Briz owner wants the season to end. Is this just personal vested interest? Yeah, I think every, I've always said, you know, my, my interests at Portsmouth Football Club and that's my first to number 100 priority. That's, that's why I'm here to protect the interests of Portsmouth Football Club as Dara is at Peterborough and obviously Andy is at Accrington. Um, but sometimes I think everyone has to put that aside and act in the best interests of football. I think that's one of these occasions, but we also have to keep an eye on the interests of Portsmouth. And at this moment, in t so I'm trying to say, if we were, let's just say two years down the line, this had happened, we're in the championship and we're in a relegation spot, would I probably be arguing for the season to finish? Maybe, you know, so it's, it's yes, people do act in their own self-interest, but I would like to think in the scenario that I've just set out, I'm actually acting in the best interest of football generally. From other clubs' owners to our own, how is Tuanante and uh, Michael, Eisner's, Michael Eisner's other companies doing in these times? Yeah, I think um, along with all businesses, um, it depends on the sector. So different sectors are, are doing well during this current lockdown, others are not. Uh, Michael's got a broad portfolio of businesses spread across different business sectors. So really it depends on the sector, but you know, his, his businesses like Portsmouth are run very well, um, you know, got good people running them and, and I'm sure that they're doing the best that they can under very difficult circumstances for everyone. And what is their take on the current scenario? What do they see as their part in seeing the club through these times? Just as they always do, really, to support, to be there, to offer help, advice, you know, any assistance that I need, any, any assistance that the staff needs, um, they come up with good ideas. Now and again, they'll, you know, Michael will pick up the phone or Andy or Eric or just a little text, have you seen this, that another club's doing, that type of thing. But I know they're there. You know, 24-7, literally, I can pick the phone up to them. As can a lot of other members of our staff as well, you know. They're very supportive um, as, they're, as they've been throughout their time here at Portsmouth. And it's great to have them there at this period because, you know, without them and without that support, it would, it's difficult for clubs at this moment in time. We've seen a lot of development going on in the North Stand at the moment, but what effect has the pandemic had on the Milton End developments? Well... It was a shame, really, because before the pandemic, we, we were really moving 
along with discussions with you know the the council and um, network rail it, I felt like things were ramping up quite a bit there and obviously everyone's got into semi hibernation now because of of the lockdown I'm hopeful that when we come out the other side we can pick that momentum up um, a lot of depend on government policy whether they are looking to now start putting some money into infrastructure projects and just hasten to add not the Milton end or anything that we're doing at Fratton Park but in regards of the infrastructure at stations um, you know the local rail network transport infrastructure because all of those things still remain the same that before we are going to start any what I would call major redevelopment works at Fratton Park we need assurances that this work is going to be done or at least partnered with us on doing this work and as I say, we are in, we remain in contact with them, but a lot now will be, de be dependent on the state of the British economy and how they consider the best way to kickstart this economy. I think the vibes are positive in regards to the government are fully aware that potentially, well, we are in a recession situation. Um, and the way to try and get out of that is to invest in big key projects. And, and ho so hopefully it could be to our advantage. Should we go behind closed doors and matches go behind closed doors? The EFL have been very public by saying I follow would be a solution. Would season ticket holders get a free pass? It's one of a number of discussions that are currently ongoing in regards of how do we address um, the loss of the four games this season. And, and there's a broad spectrum really of, of opinions on that. Um, but until we get the final decision that one games can go ahead because that that sets you off down one route games going ahead with fans is another route games going ahead with no fans is another route so until we get the the actual definitive answer to that question we can't i don't want to really speculate because it will be mark said this mark said that but that will apply to a certain specific set of circumstances that we make a specific decision but to, to go back to the main question, I follow for fans, for season ticket holders, it is definitely on the agenda and something that we are discussing. You mentioned earlier, Mark, about players who are running to the end of their contract at the end of this season. But what's the situation with loan players and their potential continued participation? So at the moment, con the contracts are contracts. And, you know, we have got players that are falling out of con loan contracts before when the season could potentially commence or during the period when the um, season you know hopefully commences but the from my understanding is the EFL are looking at solutions and as long as the um, the host club and the loan loaning club are in agreement agreement and the player wants to stay I'm, my understanding is they are going to be flexible with that but I'm hoping to get some guidance during this week on that subject. Mark, do you support the view that clubs who don't pay wages are later transfer embargoed? Oh, that's a difficult one because these are unprecedented times. Um, yeah, I think there would be something morally wrong for a club to be able to go out and, as an example, pay a transfer fee for a new player when it is still not paid the wages of its existing players. So... I think given all scenarios, it sounds pretty harsh on clubs here, but I do think that is the right way to do it. If you've got the money to go out and pay a transfer fee for a player, then really that money should be going to cover any debts as such that you've got with your existing players. Mark, how long can football and Pompey in particular survive without paying fans? Um, oh, it's another difficult question and every club's in a, in a different position. All I can say is you know most clubs I think will get through this year because from a cash flow point of view the EFL and the gov align with the government's furlough scheme and and the rates holiday has front loaded a lot of money but <coughs> of the money that we've received from the EFL that is effectively just a loan among um, brought forward in regards of future payments that you would be getting later on in the year so I think in the short term for the for let's just say from March till the end of this season, probably enough has been done from a cash flow point of view to get clubs through that short term. If you then go on to next year, potentially behind closed doors, 
then I think this, the scenario looks very bleak for a, a lot of clubs because not only are they going to be not uh, having access to match day revenue, but during that period when they would be getting their solidarity payments and their media rights money from Sky, they won't be getting it because it's been front loaded to this period now. So I do fear for that midterm three to nine month period. Um, given, you know, our owners and align with how we run the club, we, I'm fairly confident we could ride that out. It will hurt. Obviously, it's going to hurt financially for, for everyone. But given worst case scenarios running into years, all I can assure you is we will be one of the last clubs standing. But let's, let's not go down that route. Hopefully, you know, somewhere between now and, and then some solutions can be found. But unfortunately, Jack, I don't think this is unique to football. If, if you look at cinemas, theatres, restaurants, bars, clubs, you know, there's a whole host of industries that if you're talking about their fan base as such, in, in our instance, you know, clients to, to other businesses, but in our instance, our fans, which is our main source of income, not, not having access to that, then this isn't going to be a, a, a problem unique to football. This is going to be a, a problem unique to businesses, you know, throughout the United Kingdom and the world. It's very um, easy, you know, we're talking about football, obviously, you know, Q&A, it, it's what it's about. But, you know, sadly, just want to say we have lost members of the Pompey family during this period. And I just urge everyone to follow the government guidelines, you know, keep doing what we're doing. You know, Portsmouth's great. We're especially great when our backs against the wall. I don't need to tell people from Portsmouth that, but it's, you have to put all of football in context. And there's not a day goes by now where I'm not getting an email where someone that has supported Portsmouth, you know, either, you know, members of their family are emailing me, um, telling me that sadly they've passed away or are very ill. And we're doing what we can there along with what we're doing in the community. But at this time, that really is our priority. And the health and well-being, not just of our fans, but people generally, that has to take the absolute priority. So, yeah, we've got to get on with our normal lives in regards of having the Q&As and talking about football. But I just ask everyone just to bear in mind that, that as important football is to us all, you know, it is, there's a lot going on out there. And I think our first game back, you know, with fans, you know, hopefully sooner rather than later, that we are working on plans to, to remember all those that have passed during this time. So just stay safe, everyone.